Good evening, everyone. My name is Roxanne Etmetchen, and I'm the president of the Cambridge Yerevan Sister City Association. Thank you all for coming to our annual meeting and program, the third year that we're holding it virtually through Zoom. In past years, when meetings were held in person, the Cisco uh, business meeting had been the first part of the event, followed by a program with the guest speaker or speakers. This year, as we did last year, we're changing up the order of the evening and we'll hear from our guest speaker first to be followed by the business meeting part of the event. I do want to mention that the speaker part of the evening is being recorded. And if you don't want to have your image recorded, you can ensure that by stopping your video camera now for this part of the event. We plan to make the presentation available via our website and YouTube channel. We'll keep our audience muted during this part of the evening to provide the best quality but audio, similar to what you would get if you were attending a webinar. And now, and now allow me to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Gerard Girard Libaridian, who will share some of his thoughts on the current situation in Armenia. We're honored to have Professor Libaridian here with us tonight. He's no stranger to Siska, and the relationship goes back a few decades. Gerard Libaridian is a retired professor of Armenian history at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He's the author of numerous books, articles, and reports on modern Armenian history, contemporary politics, and international relations published in a number of Western and Middle Eastern languages. He has taught and lectured extensively in institutions of higher learning in the US and internationally. From 1991 to 1997, Gerard Libaridian served as advisor to the first president of Armenia and as first deputy minister of foreign affairs, secretary of the National Security Council and chief negotiator with Azerbaijan and Turkey, among others. He is currently working on a number of new book projects. There will be a question and answer period at the end of, end of Professor Libaridian's talk. You may use the Zoom chat function to send a question to the host at any time during his talk or during the Q&A period itself, and it'll be answered at the end. I do want to note that the Q&A period will be devoted to actual questions addressed to the speaker and not to comments. I thank you in advance for keeping that in mind. Now, please welcome Professor Libaritian. Thank you, Roxanne. <clears throat> I see a number of uh, friendly, familiar faces, and I say hello to everyone. Um, and I'm happy to see you all. Uh, let me begin by uh, saying my main role in uh, Siska. This is a part of the history of Siska, 1987, <clears throat> when uh, this is during the Soviet period, of course, the mayor of Yerevan, comrade Avakian was here and he had a number of discussions with the city officials in Cambridge and our colleague Kevort Bardakchian was the uh, translator. And then he, for some reason, couldn't continue and ask me to do so which meant that I had to drink more than I liked to uh, because Ngeravakian was a uh, consummate consumer of, uh, of libations. And anyway, after all the discussions, we went to his hotel room uh, <clears throat> and uh, he said, what do you think? Should we do this thing? Should we agree? And I said, what's the problem? He said, well, Cambridge is a small town and we are a Republican level capital. Why should we 
uh, not try to find some uh, bigger city. And I said, well, uh, Angera Vakyan, have you read Moses Horenazi? Moses Horenazi, fifth century Armenian chronicler, uh, started his history of Armenians by saying, although we are small in numbers, we have done important deeds, important enough to be worthy of registration, of writing it down. So I said, look, if you do nothing but benefit from Harvard and MIT, you will do much more than if you go and become a sister city with Washington. So uh, he agreed, he thought it was a good advice and that's how he signed it the next day. So I wanted to, um, uh, to mention that for, for the record. Um, let me see what happened to my text. Okay. All right. Uh, if you had told me in uh, November of 2020 that there would be sadder days than November 9, where Armenia had to sign a very humiliating ceasefire agreement with Azerbaijan after the second Garapal war, I would not have believed it, but I think we are there now. What I want to do is raise, uh, distill everything that I think is happening in Armenia. And I was there seven weeks this past time, uh, came back in uh, mid-April. Uh, I want to distill them into the questions that are being debated in Armenia today at different levels. First is the assessment of the 2020 war and its aftermath. Who is responsible? Well, uh, there are different answers to this question. One is that Pashinyan, the prime minister is responsible. Other answers are that Pashinyan and the last 25 years of leadership and mentality are responsible. <clears throat> then there are those who combine one of these with uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan, of course, are responsible. Um, it's everyone but me uh, kind of situation, although Pashinyan has started recognizing that he could have made some wiser decisions at different times. I don't want to go into uh, too much detail, but that is uh, who lost Garapach type of discussion. Uh, then there's the meaning of the 2020 war. That is, uh, how do you see it? What do you do with it? And uh, how do you interpret it? And we have uh, essentially three uh, positions. Uh, one I will not discuss because there's nothing to discuss. One that says, it doesn't matter, I'm no longer interested. Uh, and that may be a good portion of the population of Armenia today. The um, big uh, opposition, what is now opposition, is uh, that Turkey and Azerbaijan are essentially anti-Armenian and genocidal states and peoples. <clears throat> and uh, that's why they started the war. And that's what we should get out of it. Uh, that we are now in grave danger again. And um, uh, these two states are aiming at eliminating our, our people and new genocide and eliminating the state of Armenia. And uh, we are in an existential situation. We have an existential threat. And uh, that's uh, that the war of 2020 proves that. That's the lesson we should learn from the war. And the other, and this is what the opposition basically, uh, the opposition being uh, the second and third presidents, the Tashnaksun, and <clears throat> a number of various uh, groups of people, including some who call themselves intellectuals. 
And they expected that the war would prove their point, that there's nothing more to learn and to think about than to say, see, the 2020 war is evidence of the position uh, that you cannot talk to the Turks, you cannot talk to the Azerbaijanis, it is no use, their intention, they are born to kill Armenians, they are born, they kill Armenians, they have coffee and then they die. Uh, this is uh, the kind of logic that there's, and which precludes then negotiations that you cannot really negotiate uh, with them, you cannot talk to them because by essence they are killers. And also the second conclusion is that uh, that means that we have to get closer to Russia. Now, opposing this uh, is the idea that the uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan had specific issues to resolve with Armenia related to Garapa, and they resolved it by war and uh, we lost the war. And now we have to face realities uh, the diminished capabilities of the Armenian army, state, and also recognize that we were basically alone. Uh, no one helped us. And in fact, Russia uh, colluded with Azerbaijan. And therefore we have to think now of what we can save of what's left of our sovereignty and the state. That there is no alternative to negotiations. Uh, that we have to find ways to diminish the threat, whatever that threat is, although it is uh, not a threat of genocide, uh, and I'll talk about that later. Now, so I should mention that the, the first group expected its narrative to dominate, but oddly enough, um, it did not happen because the second uh, path uh, that used to be a minority seems to have become uh, much larger. I don't know if it's a majority or not, but the government now that is very attuned to uh, popular positions is pursuing that uh, very position of negotiating directly with Azerbaijan uh, and Turkey, sometimes with Russia's help, sometimes with the European Union help, uh, but uh, this is uh, what is happening. My sense was that the newer generation, uh, and in fact, a, a good number of older people thought that if we lost after all that nationalist position, uh, we lost the war, uh, then there, possibly there might have been something wrong with the way we were thinking and approaching uh, the situation. And uh, now the, the second group, including the government currently, is uh, negotiating with the purpose of securing Armenia's sovereignty at borders uh, to get the best possible uh, result for Garapag and to decrease any danger and threat that comes from the two neighbors. Now, there's the question of the role of Russia, Europe and the West in, in what is happening now. We know uh, that the Minsk group that used to be the main mediator is finished. Uh, in my opinion, and I've written this for over 20 years, it was in a coma for a long time. And now it is basically uh, finished because the Russians said the West doesn't want to work with them. And instead of the Minsk group, Russia appointed uh, the co-chair, the, the person who used to be the co-chair of the Minsk group, the Russian co-chair is now the special representative of the Russian president. And I think similarly, the US and France have done the same. Uh, there's a question in people's mind as to how much you can rely on Russia. And uh, some people who want to rely on Europe and the US as counterbalance to Russia, but there's also the question whether what these two uh, international players can do. Uh, essentially, uh, there's a sense, uh, I'm not sure it's the majority of Armenians, but there's a sense that all players internationally are now trying to use Armenia and the Garapal issue for control of the South Caucasus. And in the big battle now that has evolved, particularly after the Ukraine war on whether uh, the South Caucasus will be under Russian protectorate and uh, dominion or uh, the West will still have some role to play there. Um, 
Now, the next question is, uh, what options does Armenia actually have and in, in what issues? It is very clear that the loss of the war uh, has minimized the options Armenia has. Um, and these options have been narrow, narrowing down for the past 25 years. The longer we postponed a peaceful resolution, the less options we had and the war made it clear that we had lost all options. We have to realize, and I'm surprised, uh, well, not surprised, but uh, Pashinyan is not saying this outright, but it is very clear, at least to me and to some people that Armenia has little left to say on the future of Karabakh. Uh, it will be Russia and Azerbaijan primarily that will decide what happens to Karabakh and how it survives in what shape and form and with, the, with what we know that internationally, including Russia, uh, internationally, the Karabakh is, was and is now more clearly recognized as part of Azerbaijan. When Aliyev and the Azerbaijani army invaded, uh, restarted the war and came and took one third of Karabakh, I don't know of any country that said, no, you can't do that. Uh, and Putin during and after the war specified many times uh, that Karapa is part of Azerbaijan. Now there are maybe other issues to be resolved, but uh, that's, that's it. And neither the US nor France nor anyone else has disagreed with that. Now, what we have is um, the opposition in Armenia uh, and the question as to who should rule who should govern Armenia, and how do you decide who governs Armenia? Now, uh, personally, I think Pashinyan should have resigned. Personally, I don't think he's the best person to guide these new negotiations, uh, but still the fact is that he, the whole question of his responsibility for the war and for the loss and for the unwise decisions, all of those questions were adjudicated so to speak, during the May 21 elections when the opposition said he should resign. Well, the outcome is that those who voted, about 50% of those who qualified to vote, those who voted, voted to keep him. And that means quite a bit. That is, they prefer to keep a leader who lost the war, who made those very bad decisions, to keep him rather to have Kocharyan who, uh, represents other problems. So, uh, so why do we have this opposition still in the streets? I'll come to that later. Now, the situation has been complicated by the war in Ukraine. Uh, and there's a big question. People are debating. What will be the impact of uh, the end of this war when it comes, even if hostilities continue, at some point there will be some kind of a uh, quieter or end of uh, fighting. Uh, what will Putin uh, look like and what will he do if he wins? What will he do if he loses? Is he more dangerous in the first case or the second case? Or regardless, he will try, uh, since the world is now divided again, the Cold War that had never disappeared in my view, uh, now it has resurfaced clearly, uh, Russia versus the rest. Since that has come back, then uh, there will have to be more limited options for uh, South Caucasus states, or uh, more likely South, the South Caucasus now is at play. That is, we're not sure how it will go because we know Georgia uh, is very pro-Western, although the government is much more uh, deliberate and, and careful. Azerbaijan plays all sides. In fact, the big winner is, is Azerbaijan, not only because it regained its territories and one third and of Garapal and has the big say so, far more than Armenia as to what happens to what is left of Garapal, but also because of the options he has created for himself 
as a, a powerful country in the region uh, that is supported by not just Turkey and Pakistan, uh, used to be Ukraine because Ukraine doesn't matter anymore, Israel and many other states. So uh, Azerbaijan has become a much bigger player. So the West and France and Europe, uh, the US have now, are now trying to, uh, to say uh, to the South Caucasus that if you oppose Russia, we are with you. Now, so each Republic will have to decide how to handle this. Um, and um, uh, the question still remains as to uh, what happens, uh, how each outside player looks at this region and each Republic. Now, um, I'm sorry to say that all of this has brought up two very painful questions in Armenia. That is now there's what I, it's what seems to be an orchestrated campaign to uh, dismiss the significance of sovereignty. This is as simple as that, that it is not so important for Armenia to be independent. Uh, there are uh, very significant uh, players in Armenia who think Armenia should simply become uh, de facto a province of Russia. This is very real. Uh, I don't think that most people in Armenia agree, uh, but uh, that there are powerful forces inside and, and outside of Armenia who are working on this, who are talking about this. And one way of doing it is to exaggerate in my view and to abuse the question of the genocide and to create and, and intensify the fear of a new genocide, when in fact the threat Armenia faces is not genocide, in my view. Uh, it is the threat of not acting on, on the realities that surround it. Uh, and those realities are not uh, the threat of genocide. Now, the second point that is also new to me uh, that I didn't realize so much in last December when I was there, the second question is that there's a direct assault on democracy itself. And it comes in different forms. Uh, one is that the opposition that tried to unseat Pashinyan and was unsuccessful through the vote now is saying democracy is not needed. What we need is a strong man. Uh, uh, and the, in fact, they projected back saying, if we're the strong man in Armenia, during the war, we would not have lost the war. So, and there are others who hide all of this under the title of we need national unity and Pashinyan is not the one who can do it. We should do it without Pashinyan and then get rid of Pashinyan with, uh, with unconstitutional means if needed. Now, so uh, here's the thing. Um, it is one thing to say that maybe Armenia has no choice and Russia will come back with a vengeance whether it wins or loses the war in Ukraine and will say to Armenia, you belong to me and that's all there is to it. And you know, maybe it's, it's a possibility, but it's another thing for Armenian players, parties, leaders of different kinds of leaders, not just political uh, who say, it is good for us not to have sovereignty. It is good for us not to have democracy. So the question is uh, whether the government that is elected duly will be allowed to function and will be supported under the best of circumstances, uh, whether one likes Pashinyan or not, it is he's the only legitimately elected leader um, there's no other leader who's elected as legitimately as he has. And uh, to, to find a way uh, to see if the layers of sovereignty can be maintained and increased, whether a realistic solution can be found to Garapal, and whether an in, a state can be preserved that is called independence. And nothing less is at stake it, because 
the question of independence and democracy are linked together. And uh, the question of um, undermining the government, um, the strategy involves both uh, undermining sovereignty, the value of sovereignty and independence and undermining the significance of democracy. Because if we go with democracy, then the answer to who leads Armenia is clear. But if we don't want him for any reason and we want another policy, then we need to say democracy is not the best way to protect the interests of Armenians. One final point, I have not seen yet uh, opposition parties, leaders propose any solution other than what Pashinyan is doing. I don't agree with everything he says or does, but overall the line that you have to come to terms with your neighbors. Uh, I don't see anything else but to say we go under Russia. Now, if going under Russia meant that Armenia could uh, save the independence of, or could bring Garapal's independence or recover any of the lost territories or provide more security, then it would have been a legitimate uh, debate. But Russia was part of the game that was played that resulted in the 2020 war. So uh, the debate that is the debates that are going on are in fact not so much debates as hardened positions and, and uh, very dangerous uh, point in Armenia's history, the Third Republic's history. Thank you. Thank you, Yujirair. Um, and now um, we'll entertain questions for, for the professor. Uh, if you have a question, you can submit it through the chat. And I can read it out loud. Is anyone able to use the chat? Is there an issue there? Um, okay, here's, here is a question. Soviet Russia dismembered Armenia. Why would we believe it would not give all of Artsakh back to Azerbaijan as well as part of Sunik? Um, why would Russia not give? Well. If Russia agreed uh, that uh, none of Garapa should be left, it has no excuse to be in Azerbaijan. And being in Azerbaijan militarily is an important policy uh, goal for Russia. Unless Russia comes to a new deal with Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan says, okay, we'll give you a military base uh, uh, but we need to get rid of Armenia, Armenians in Garapa. So uh, at this point, Russia's interest is, uh, it was before the war and its agreement for Azerbaijani's attack was that it would allow itself, it would allow Russia to bring peacekeeping forces. Okay. Uh, this one is, hello, Dr. Libaridian, how is the mood of the people? Is there hope in their eyes for their country to be safe and exist in 10 years? You know, it's a good question for which I'm not sure I am fully qualified to answer, at least the people that I saw and I met, and I can say that I met about 50 different kinds of people over 10 weeks and seven different groups, different kinds of groups who wanted to meet me. 
uh, and my sense is that they're, they want to have hope, that they feel that they are in a very difficult situation. And some of them see uh, some hope in the negotiations with Turkey and Azerbaijan. That is, one thing is clear, they don't want more wars. And they think the continuation of the hard line that was before the war that made war inevitable, that that hard line is not helping. And that is evident from the lack of uh, full support for the opposition. That was evident with the vote of parliamentary elections last May. It is evident now, uh, even today, you know, when they're trying to create a popular wave to bring down Pashinyan, uh, I don't see the numbers there. And also there is, um, they are tired of the rhetoric and they're not buying the narrative. Now, of course, there are those who are buying the narrative that we will be killed. But if, if that was taken seriously, then, you know, they would have left the country. Uh, of course, if they could. There's a, there's a poll, which I, I don't know how much to rely on, that says the percentage of people who are opposed to any kind of negotiation with, uh, negotiations with Turkey and Azerbaijan is uh, about 30% or one third, which is not too much. Uh, which would be the equivalent of Trump's Trump space in this country. So the hardliners. Um, the rest, I would assume, are in support to one extent or another. There may be, and there are doubts on whether how serious Turkey is in the negotiations, but that's a different thing then uh, saying that they're coming to commit genocide. See, we have to distinguish that. Um, my, my understanding of the negotiations is that those negotiations with Turkey are important for Armenia. They're essential for Armenia so that there's a balance and they minimize the danger from Turkey. Uh, but it's not essential for Turkey. Turkey can go on uh, without normalizing relations with Armenia. But it doesn't mean that Turkey is going to come and attack. In fact, in 30 years, there hasn't been uh, one case of its Turkish soldiers crossing the border, violating Armenia's territory integrity. It hasn't happened. It simply hasn't happened. Uh, no matter how much people have cried, they're coming and they're coming, but uh, you know they haven't come. For them, it's not that important. Uh, to, to normalize or not to, it would be good. It has some advantages, uh, uh, economic and, uh, and internationally, but it's not that important. So do people have hope? They're waiting to see, but they are supporting negotiations with Azerbaijan. And I am quite sure that if Pashinyan and his government were not sure that they will be supported by people, they would not do it. Pashinyan is a populist and he, he will, uh, he's become much more serious since the war, uh, unlike others who have learned no lessons from the war. Uh, but um, I, I can't say that he's the best negotiator, but I can say that he's on the right path and he would not do it if he thought that the majority of Armenians oppose it. There is a question here, I think, related to what you just said. Did not Turkish F-16s and drones violate Armenian airspace? Did not? Well, they may have. They violate Greek air airspace every day. But it does mean they're coming to commit genocide. This is, this is the key. Uh, you know, you, I have no problem understanding that we have fears, okay? Uh, I have no problem seeing a threat, but we have to see what is that threat? Because you, you, you cannot take fear 
and turn it into a strategy. You take fear and analyze it and specify it and crystallize it and say, this is what I think is the threat. And this is what I can do in order to, uh, to deal with the threat. Uh, but the, uh, those who oppose negotiations, in my view, uh, rely on this, the, um, in fact, the abuse of the word genocide and the fact of the genocide of 1915 in order to ask people not to think specifically and strategically and politically. It's one thing for a cab driver uh, to say there was genocide, we shouldn't talk to the Turks and they're coming. It's another thing for a government to say it or a, or a political party to say it. They, the Turks have done a number of things and the, um, the question of the airspace is the least of my concern. That, that happens very often and I don't see that Greece is waiting to be massacred. We, we have to be statesmen, leaders of governments have responsibility to be specific as much as they can. And there's uh, uh, now other people say other things. They helped Azerbaijan. Well, they helped Azerbaijan. They have been telling us, you guys have gone to another country. This is the way they view it. They've gone to another country. You have taken someone else's land and that's it and you need to get out. We helped our brothers get out of that. This is their logic. They also have other concerns, of course, but uh, once they got out, then you know uh, they were able to take uh, what they wanted and make sure that Karapa is no longer a threat. Um, you know, it's, let me add something here. When we think of the enemy, the antagonist, the enemy, um, we don't think of how the enemy sees it. This is not to say you should accept it, but you have to see how they see it. For example, what was Aliyev doing? Uh, creating problems on the border. If you say he was getting ready to attack Sunik and take Zangezur, then you have to ask why didn't they do it during the war? You have to ask, why didn't he take Stepanagerd when he could have during the war? If you say he was trying to get rid of all of us, then why didn't he do it? He can do it now, why is he not doing it? If you have the wrong interpretation for the actions of the other guy, then you will have the wrong policy. You cannot have a good answer, a good response policy. So we have to really understand. In my view, he was trying to put pressure on Armenia saying, look, you, uh, you signed the November 9 agreement and you haven't really respected it fully. So now, um, if we decide that the enemy is whatever we want it to be, then we're not really debating, we're not developing policy. We are negotiating with ourselves. This is the problem. We need to negotiate with the other. We have to understand the other and give the right interpretation. Otherwise, we have whatever policy we have will not be the right one. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, you know, and we also don't think this is the second point in this respect as to how what we say and do impacts the other. Okay. Now, when Garapan leaders today say that we want independence and or we better yet, we want to be part of Russia. We want to do a plebiscite to ask our people, do you want to have this land uh, that is Garapal be part of Russia? Shouldn't we think as to what that means to Aliyev and to the Azerbaijani government and to the people just to understand what we're dealing with? We always talk about what Aliyev has done wrong and he's done so many things wrong and bad. But then we also have to look as to, is there anything that we could have said or done differently in order not to provoke at least with regard to Turkey, right? We call them all kinds of names. We don't trust them. <coughs> we curse them. But at the same time, we are so afraid that 
we want to give up democracy and independence. Now, these two don't go together. You know, if we are afraid of a crazy neighbor, then we have to behave as if that neighbor was crazy. We can't go and behave as if that neighbor was nothing. So there's a fundamental uh, problem with the way we even formulate our questions. And this is a problem with Azerbaijan as well. Well, anyway, other questions. There's another question here. Um, the IMF and others have forecasted a 10 to 15 year window until Azeri oil is largely exhausted for export. Oil is over 80% of their economy. What would be the risks of a Venezuela style failure uh, in Azerbaijan on Armenia's borders in that time frame? Well, that, uh, you know, when Azerbaijan had not yet started exporting oil or gas, and when I was in the government and we had discussions, our late uh, defense minister at the time, Vasken Sarkisyan, asked me to, uh, to do a study as to what are the projections of what is to come in terms of income to Azerbaijan, right? Uh, and I did that study. That is, I asked some good advisors in Europe, um, specialists on the matter, to, to give me answers, and we discussed it. And the answer was, yeah, okay, you know, so what? They'll get 500, 600 million, a billion a year. Oh, that will be wasted, right? It will go into corruption, into people's pockets. Well, you know, and my answer was, well, half of it may go, but the other half will go to the army. Now, so it was a way of dismissing what was real. Now, 10, 15 years is a long time to begin with. 10, 15 years, we need to recover from the loss of this war, okay? So even if that assumption is true, <clears throat> that they will run out of oil, uh, there's still the gas that may continue. And I don't know that they will run out of even oil now. But what we don't realize that Azerbaijan is diversifying its economy. And it is investing worldwide in ventures that will bring more money when the oil is out. So <clears throat> to count on Azerbaijan uh, that it will lose its money uh, is not the best way to think of the future uh, of the country that is next and that we dismissed. See, we have a couple more questions here. Can you comment on the, the situation with everyday people's health, medical care, economics, jobs, daily life, and what you've seen? Well, health is improving bit by bit. The Minister of Health is working uh, and mostly well. There's still old establishment people who have vested interests in certain medical practices in excessive testing to make money to have your friends make money and a number of practices and there is an attempt to improve that education has gone down quite a bit and that is in most people's view the key to beginning to change armenia education uh, from kindergarten to the university. Now, the university, I can say a couple of words because there's a new rector, there's a new president, Hovanes Hovanesian, who asked to meet me and I met him twice. And uh, I was even invited to talk to the faculty of the International Relations Department and to graduate students there for the first time since 1992. Uh, and uh, the president wanted to explain to me what he wants to do with the university. I think he's uh, imaginative enough and courageous enough to do it, but uh, you cannot change, you can change institutionally the university, 
But if the quality of students coming to your university is not that that must be uh, in order to make it an internationally uh, acceptable university, then it will not become an internationally acceptable university. So there, there has to be much more work. But in every possible area, there are old institutions and habits. Employment, the employment situation is better than it was. Uh, first, because there's more immigration, uh, but secondly, there are sectors of the economy that are improving. Uh, service economy, uh, the IT economy. Uh, some of you may have seen the number of companies that are moving from Moscow to Yerevan. Uh, NVIDIA, for example, uh, that's my nephew, by the way, who's doing it. He's a vice president of NVIDIA. Um, uh, there were what you could see in everyday life in Yerevan, 30 to 40,000 Russian IT AI people, young people with their families who uh, fled Moscow and Russia because they were afraid of you know, the situation. And uh, some of them will stay in Armenia, others will move on to Europe and maybe the US because they're valuable. They're, they're you know, brain power. Uh, but uh, Armenia will become a more important center for uh, IT and artificial intelligence. Uh, the economy, there's inflation and a lot of families are, have difficulty in, in uh, providing for themselves. There's some social support, there's some support from the outside. Uh, but still, it's very tough for many of them, uh, particularly when remittances have decreased and remittances are, a good percentage are from Russia. Uh, it's still coming, but uh, it is expected that that will become more of a problem. Okay, there are a couple more questions. Where is the migration coming from besides Russia? Ukraine. There's some from Ukraine. Uh, there's trickling from the Armenian diaspora. Um, some young professionals who are moving there. And my daughter is among them. She has moved to Armenia with the kids. And I think uh, she will stay. Uh, she's helping with the uh, health uh, area. She's an MD. Uh, but there are others, not just her, in different, uh, in different uh, disciplines from the UK, from the US, from Europe. It's not much, but it is quality immigration. And uh, some, again, trickling from uh, Syria and Lebanon and a little bit from Iran. Uh, there's a qualitative increase, but quantity wise, it's not uh, that yet. Okay, there was another question here um, about, about Pashinyan. Um, how do Armenians deal with a person like Pashinyan who has jailed strong leaders and put his own friends in these positions and how to get these strong leaders out of jail, the ones who he had put in. What, what are strong leaders? I don't understand. Is that Kocharyan? No, I don't believe so. Well, I, I, I don't know who are the strong leaders. If there be clarification. I, I don't know of any strong leaders who are jailed. Okay. And, and, uh, you know, one should be very careful in believing everything that is being said. I'm not a strong supporter of Pashinyan, but uh, I don't know that there are political prisoners. There are people who are corrupt, people who were corrupt and part of the reason for the defeat was the corruption in the army, in the defense establishment. I mean, it's not possible to think that Kocharyan and Sersaksyan and Donoyan and, and uh, Seyran Ohanian build, build uh, you know, uh, their wealth on, on the basis of their salaries as government mm -hmm. officials. So 
people expected him to put oligarchs in prison. And most, yes. a lot of people don't think he's done enough of that. But just because someone speaks strongly doesn't mean that they are strong leaders. Okay, Those and that leaders example here, not... I'm sorry. There yeah. was a, a follow-up of the, yeah. the mayor of Baird, I understand, as, as a follow-up to that question, who has been put in jail in Baird. Well, I'm not familiar with that situation, but we know uh, uh, that you know, the situation has improved by international standards. Uh, there were many more political prisoners under Kocharyan and Sersaksyan, and I don't know of any reports of political prisoners in Armenia. Okay. One more question that gets back to the, um, the migration. How, how is that influx of, of so many different peoples, Ukrainians, Russians, and Armenians from Russia and Ukraine affecting Armenia? Well, the most immediate impact is that uh, rents have gone up in Armenia, in particular in Yerevan. And uh, uh, that is a very serious issue. Um, part of the inflation is because of this influx of huge number. Mm -hmm. And these people are not uh, poor people. Okay, they're not refugees in the sense that they left everything and they came. Usually, <clears throat> they are employees of international companies who are taking care of them to some degree or another. Mm -hmm. And I should add that there's also a huge number in Georgia and in Istanbul and some in Baku. So this is uh, up to 200,000 IT AI people may have left. Mm -hmm. Now, there's also, uh, so there's, you can say that there's a huge contribution to the economy because in February and March, hotels are usually occupied 10 to 20%. At the end of February, you could not find a hotel room in Yerevan. Cafes are full, restaurants are full. People are spending, those newcomers are spending, the Russians, the Ukrainians, a lot of money. But what is not noted is that there's a lot of uh, academics, Russian, uh, academics who have fled Russia, who have no money. They got enough to get their family or themselves on a plane and came to Yerevan. And it's their colleagues in Yerevan, Armenian colleagues who are housing them, helping them. So there's a lot of uh, stress and distressed people uh, among those who are coming, but the majority are not uh, in that situation. And there was a survey um, and most will eventually leave. And I just read something in the New York Times today that Germany is going to have a program to bring those people to Germany. It's a huge influx of high level, well-trained uh, and AI workers. Well, I'm seeing we're reaching the top of the hour, eight o'clock, and I think we've gone through all of the uh, questions that were submitted. Um, do you have any parting thoughts, Professor Libarijan, for yeah. us? Well, it was very difficult to prepare for this because I had to distill so much uh, and think as to what needed to be said uh, there's so much more that can be said, but uh, I can um, advise uh, everyone, if you guys are interested, if anyone is interested, um, it, last August, uh, three of us, uh, two from two French Armenians and myself, we authored a very extensive white paper. Uh, it's called the uh, 2020 war and uh, Armenia's future uh, foreign and security policies. It's in English, in Armenian, in French, I think also in Russian. And if you uh, Google white paper Libaridian, you'll find it. That's how I find it when I need it. Uh, so it's a long paper, but it is a, I don't think there's anything like it uh, in the marketplace of ideas and analyses. 
uh, and most of it uh, still holds true. Um, uh, and that way I can share much more than just what we talked today. Looks at the causes, uh, impact and options that are available. And that should do it. All right. Well, thank you, Professor Liberidian. Thank you so much You're for welcome. sharing your, your thoughts with us. And we appreciate your taking the time to, to join us this evening. Thank you. <coughs> Good luck. Bye-bye. Okay. <coughs> to end the, um, the recording here, as soon as I figure out how to do this. <coughs>